This conference will now be recorded. Good morning and welcome. Welcome to the October monthly partnership meeting of SCDRP, the Southeast and Caribbean Disaster Resilience Partnership. My name is Heather McCarthy and I have the honor of serving as the executive director of SCDRP. I am joining you today from sailing vessel Sunseeker docked on the Ortega River, a lovely urban tributary of the mighty St. John's River that runs through Jacksonville, Florida. And where are you joining us from today? We gather here every month from all corners of the southeastern United States and Caribbean. For those of you just arriving, if you would, please take a minute, type your name, affiliation, and location into the chat box. And thank you so much for joining us today. A warm hello and welcome. So here's the agenda for the SCDRP October Monthly Partnership Meeting. First, some updates regarding SCDRP staff and our January 2024 annual meeting. Then we will hear from today's super speakers, Alex Butler and Kim Waddell, with big updates on resilience efforts from South Carolina and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Then we will look ahead at the tentative ballot for our upcoming election for four open seats on the SCDRP Advisory Board and preview our social media outlets and our next monthly partnership meeting. Lastly, we will wrap up with partner sharing time, so please get your announcements ready to share. First, a staff update. Since our last partnership meeting, our SCDRP program coordinator, Emily Noakes, Wave Emily has accepted a fabulous position with our parent nonprofit organization, Sakura. Emily is Sakura's new communications and engagement specialist. So we will still get to see her from time to time. And congratulations, Emily. We've been searching and interviewing for her replacement, and we will introduce to you our new SCDRP program coordinator next month. Mark your calendars. The SCDRP 2024 annual meeting is officially scheduled for January 23rd and 24th, 2024 at the DeSoto Hotel in the historic district of downtown Savannah, Georgia. The steering committee and field trips subcommittee have been working hard to organize a dynamite lineup of content, excursions, speakers, and panelists. And I want you to know we are planning a pre-meeting field trip on Monday, January 22nd from about 1 to 5 p.m. There will This will be a guided tour of resilience efforts along the beaches and salt marshes of Tybee Island. We will take the old Savannah trolley minibuses to and from the DeSoto Hotel. We're also planning a nighttime dinner cruise on board a Savannah River boat and a go at your own pace walking scavenger hunt of sites around downtown Savannah that reflect climate adaptation and mitigation like green roofs, etc. Also, Get excited for a tour of Chatham County Emergency Operations Center, a five minute walk from the DeSoto Hotel. And then after our main meeting, we are collaborating again with Duke University who will be hosting a round table discussion on the current status and future of hazard insurance and financing. Now, some of these high level professionals from FEMA and insurance commissioners will be joining our last panel on Wednesday, January 24th. So plan on staying until the very end. So I'm very excited to see everyone in person in Savannah and registration will open soon. And now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you today's two super speakers, Alex Butler and Dr. Kim Waddell. Our first speaker today. Alex is the Resilience Planning Director for the South Carolina Office of Resilience, where he oversaw the development of the state's first statewide risk reduction and resilience plan. And Alex is, will be telling us more about that plan today. Alex has a BS in geology from Clemson University. Uh-oh, 
Let's see. Am I offline? Can you hear me? You're, we can you're breaking up for me a little bit. Yeah, we're breaking up before. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let me start at the, uh, let me go backwards just a little bit. I apologize. So Alex has a BS in geology from Clemson University and an MS in geography from the University of South Carolina, where his studies focused on the interaction of people, land use, and climate on the hydrological cycle of South We lost her again. for both DHEC and the Department of Natural Resources. In his spare time, Alex connects people to watersheds as a whitewater kayak instructor. Sounds fun, I wanna do that. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our second speaker, Dr. Kim Waddell, and we will flow from one presentation to the next. Kim is the project lead for the next US Virgin Islands Hazard Mitigation and Resilience Plan update with support from FEMA and the Virgin Islands Emergency Management Agency, VATIMA. He is also the principal investigator and project director for the Virgin Islands Established Program for Stimulating Competitive Research, or VIEP score, a National Science Foundation supported research capacity building program based at the University of the Virgin Islands that focuses on land based impacts on marine ecosystem health and function in a time of climate change, as well as STEM education research and opportunities for underrepresented minority students from K through 12 through MS degrees. Prior to that, Kim was a senior program officer with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Dr. Waddell served as a study director for over a dozen National Academies reports on agriculture, fisheries, and other natural resource management topics. Kim received his PhD in biological sciences from the University of South Carolina and his BA in environmental studies from the University of California, Santa Cruz. A warm welcome to both of you. At this time, we will Okay, hopefully y'all can see that. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, hopefully everybody heard Heather was breaking up a bit, but my name is Alex Butler. I'm the Resilience Planning Director uh, here at the Office of Resilience um, and, and happy to announce that we have released our first statewide uh, resilience plan. Uh, it was released at the end of June. Um, you know, we, as the Office of Resilience, we, we exist to lessen the impact of disasters of, on communities uh, and the citizens of South Carolina uh, through planning, coordinating statewide resilience, long-term recovery, uh, and hazard mitigation. Uh, just real quick, our history of the office, we're, we're pretty new still. Uh, we formed after the disasters of, of 2015, 2016, and 2018, um, started off as the Disaster Recovery Office. Um, we then had a floodwater commission that was established in the state. That commission recommended the formation of our office, uh, which was created in 2020, but we didn't receive any funding until fiscal, fiscal year 2022. So really only a little over two years in operation as a full agency. Uh, and we kind of focus on three uh, main things in the disaster cycle. We, we focused on long-term disaster recovery uh, through HUD, CBD, GDR grants, um, you know, rebuilding and repairing homes for, for low to moderate income folks. Uh, we also manage a HUD uh, mitigation grant where we do buyouts, infrastructure projects, uh, plans and studies, uh, and some non and some federal match uh, grants are available through that. That was a $162 million grant that we received through HUD. And then our newest uh, operation, and that's what I'll talk about today, is, is our resilience planning. Um, and we were tasked with developing a statewide resilience plan and then managing a couple of funds that go along with that. Uh, so the resilience plan was released in uh, June, this uh, past June. Um, Encourage everybody to go online and check it out. It's about 740 pages. Um, so really quick overview today uh, on what's included, but um, hopefully you can get the gist of what we're talking about here. Uh, just a little bit of our legislative guidance. Again, we were uh, tasked with developing uh, this plan in accordance with the South Carolina Floodwater Commission principles. And I'll talk about those in just a second. 
Uh, it's really intended to serve as a framework for, to guide state investment and flood mitigation projects, uh, as well as other uh, mitigation projects for extreme weather events. And again, we were supposed to have this done um, in July 1, 2022, but uh, we did get an extension until this past July. So we, we got it in on time, which was which good, kept me employed. Uh, some of the Flood Water Commission principles. Um, first one is that flood management plans and actions need to be based on watershed boundaries. Um, my background's in hydrology, so this, this makes complete sense to me. Uh, next is that we need to base our decisions on high quality data, shared data um, that's available to everybody. Uh, we need to work on building capacity of local governments to make science-based decisions and actionable flood management plans. Uh, certainly, we understand that resilience is a largely local issue that we need to work on at the local level. And then success depends upon collaboration. Um, we're, we're a small office, so it, we really have to rely on our partners, um, some of whom I've seen on the, the chat here, C Grant, um, universities, academic partners, uh, that sort of thing, other state agencies. Um, we're working on having ongoing opportunities for public participation. Um, that's super important for us. Um, we also need to remember that flood management programs need to recognize the beneficial use of our natural systems. Uh, luckily, South Carolina is still relatively relatively undeveloped, so uh, we have some chances to make uh, some good decisions now that will prevent uh, some pain in the future. And then we need to coordinate how funding comes into the state through our federal sources and, and make sure we're coordinating that in case we do receive uh, federal funds from disaster. Uh, some planning assumptions that we started on uh, with when we started this planning is, is one, this plan is is really dealing with the adaptive side of things. We're not trying to solve climate change. Uh, we have to make sure that we're uh, dealing with future climate conditions, but we're not we're not trying to solve climate change. Uh, and we need to use an adaptive management approach. Um, we keep getting new data and information all the time, and we need to adapt the plan uh, as that becomes available. Uh, in fact, that our plan is already out of date. It was released in June. Um, since then, the, the data model we've used has been updated. So we're currently now working on getting all that information updated uh, to make available. And our first plan focused on flooding um, and future versions of the plan will go into other hazards in more detail. A uh, lot of partners involved uh, in the planning process. I won't read them all, but uh, just a, a lot of folks uh, were involved in this really intense planning effort that happened over about an 18 month period. And really the first thing we did was define what resilience means for South Carolina. Um, resilience is a real hot buzz term right now, uh, hear it a lot. So we wanted to make sure we had a clear definition for, for our state and what we were talking about. And our definition is the ability of communities, economies, and ecosystems within South Carolina to anticipate, absorb, recover, and thrive when they're presented with environmental changes or natural hazards. And if you think about it graphically, you've got a, a less absorbent system, um, less resilient system. You know, it's, it's uh, the system's functions declining over time as you have environmental pressures or lack of maintenance. You have some acute hazard that happens. The system function steeply declines. It takes a long time to coordinate federal recovery efforts and state efforts. Uh, so it's a slow recovery, and then there's always more need than there are resources available. So you never uh, recover back to where you were. And what we want is a more resilient system where we're, we're thinking about these things ahead of time, we're, we're making sure we're doing our system maintenance, we're improving our system function so they are improving over time leading up to a disaster. Um, when a disaster hits, they're, they're designed to be able to absorb that disaster uh, better so they don't decline as much. And then we coordinate the federal and state response and local response uh, so we can recover quicker and then use those resources to improve the system so our, our system's actually improving over time. Uh, one of the things we want to make sure we were doing was being able to measure if we were having any impact. Uh, so we've partnered with uh, the Havery Lab at the University of South Carolina um, to, to customize a resilience indicator uh, for our state. Um, and so it's, it's kind of based on different capitals um, listed there on the left. But, you know, really, this is the ability um, that different areas of the state have to, to be able to handle disasters. And it's not an exposure metric. Uh, as you can tell, there's a lot of high resilience areas uh, along the coast that's not to say that they don't have exposure, it's just that they have the resources to be able to, to develop resilience. And so we'll be able to measure this over time to see if we're, um, if we're having a, an effect uh, in areas where we need to improve the resilience um, statewide. Uh, we spent a lot of time going over um, our planning conditions for the state, um, you know, thinking about you know, what we needed to be thinking about as, as we're developing recommendations. And, and so we're thinking about a lot about the geology uh, the hydrology of the state, making sure we're looking at the full watershed of the state, um, you know, working across political boundaries uh, and thinking about what's happening uh, with our friends in North Carolina and Georgia, uh, thinking a lot about soils and how they impact um, 
how flood water runs off, as well as land use and, and development. Uh, because we do have uh, quite a number of people moving into the state, our population uh, graphs, if you look back to 1790 to, to now, uh, we have pretty dramatic growth. That growth is, is continued, is projected to continue. Um, our population, it's, it's not uh, growing evenly everywhere though, right? We have uh, some counties that are seeing dramatic growth, um, Horry County, the Myrtle Beach area, Charleston, uh, the Greenville, I-85 corridor, uh, seeing really dramatic growth. And then we have uh, more agricultural counties um, that are seeing population declines and pretty rapid population declines. And that, that really impacts how they're able to prepare for and, and handle uh, uh, natural hazards. And that population uh, change is, is expected to continue. Um, I know you probably can't see it on the graph, but you know, Horry County where, where Myrtle Beach is located uh, is projected to, to increase population by 72% uh, by 2035, which is a really dramatic number. Um, we're talking about all those people moving into an area that has a lot of a lot of flood hazard. Uh, we also think a lot about what our future climate looks like, um, our climate trends. We partnered with the Climatology Office, uh, the University of South Carolina, um, and South Carolina Sea Grant to develop this uh, climate chapter in the plan. Um, really taking a look at what our climate has done and what the the model projections uh, mean for South Carolina. And you know, the takeaway here is we're getting warmer. Um, uh, no surprise to anybody. Um, and we're projected to continue to get warmer uh, in the next uh, decades. And that has impacts on, on drought and, and other things. And our precipitation trends, no real precipitation trend on an annual basis. Uh, but what we are seeing is, is more intense rainfall. So we're getting you know, roughly the same amount of rainfall in any given year. It's just when it falls, we're getting it more intense, uh, more concentrated burst. Uh, we've had areas of the state that have seen you know, three, quote, thousand year flood events uh, in a five year period. And that kind of bears out when we look at uh, projections on Atlas 14 uh, rainfall runoff, uh, sorry, inundation duration frequency curve numbers. Um, you know, those those are expected to increase. Um, so, you know, we need to be planning for for those more intense rainfalls. Uh, in addition, we got to think about sea level rise. Um, so we've got the uh, NOAA sea level rise projections. We use the intermediate to intermediate high projection for our planning purposes. Um, we also are thinking about land subsidence and how that impacts uh, relative sea level. Um, so we have land subsidence along the coast, um, satellite measured, um, you know, and, and that's going to exacerbate the, the sea level rise problem. And if you look at Charleston, you know, Charleston has seen an increase in the number of tidal flood days um, going back to the 1920s. You know, like I think 2019, they had 89 days of uh, tidal flooding. And if you take that forward to the end of the century, you know, it's going to flood from just tidal flooding pretty much every day in Charleston, uh, twice a day, right, with the tides. So uh, Charleston uh, is gonna have to learn how to live with water um, and they have their own resilience planning efforts uh, ongoing. And, and I know that's part of their, their plan is trying to understand how to live with water moving forward. We were thinking about our fl flooding risk. We need to think about all types of flooding, uh, not just riverine flooding, uh, but also that flash flooding, colluvial flooding, uh, coastal flooding as well. Um, so we were using a data set from the First Street Foundation as kind of our basis for, for planning. Um, and here's just a map of, of Columbia, uh, capital of South Carolina. Uh, you can see the FEMA mapped floodplains in the, in the purples and blues, and then the First Street data model uh, in the reds and yellows. And, and you know, the takeaway here is that uh, the FEMA models just don't really capture the full flood risk uh, that we experience. The big red dot in the middle is, a, is an entertainment district here in Columbia. Um, we know that it floods. It floods on a you know random Tuesday in the summer pretty regularly. Uh, so you know, these areas we know they flood, uh, but they're not picked up by the FEMA flood map. So uh, this first street uh, data has been uh, helpful for us to get a better sense of our of our full flood risk. Uh, and it does have a forward-looking component, so we can take it forward just a little bit into 2052, and I'll flip back and forth just a couple of times. But you can see how those flood areas expand. Um, putting more uh, residents at risk over time. Uh, we can take that information and take it out statewide and look at our, our vulnerable properties. Um, so here's a map of our, our vulnerable properties that would see any level of flooding. Uh, see it's pretty well distributed statewide, a lot along the coast, um, also a lot along the I-85 corridor in the Greenville area of South Carolina. Um, so it's really a statewide problem, not just a coastal problem. And if we look forward, you know, another 30 years, we're going from about 300,000 properties to about 340,000 properties that are at risk from uh, flooding during a 100-year event. So this is just a 
you know, a hundred year event, uh, looking at about 340,000 properties that, that are at risk from any level of flooding. Uh, we take that same data and overlay it with all our kind of state data sets. So there's just one example, uh, looking at solid waste facilities. Uh, obviously, a solid waste facility, if, if you flood it, you're, you're likely to mobilize some contaminants. So um, we can see how that risk changes over time. Again, looking from 2022 to 2052, uh, we do see an increase in risk over time. Uh, similarly, we used it to look at our uh, road data set. So this is Dillon County in South Carolina. Um, we're able to take that data. Uh, we created elevation data for our roadways uh, in partnership with uh, Clemson University. Uh, and we're able to overlay that with the first street data model and, and then identify those areas of roadways that are likely to experience flooding uh, during a 100 year event. Um, we're still working on this, ground truthing some of it, um, but it, you know, we, we see it as a valuable tool uh, for planning, making sure that we're, we're targeting those roadways for resilience efforts that, that are critical uh, lifelines for uh, transportation or to get to critical services. And then also looking at how flooding can impact our economy. Uh, this example is just uh, of our um, cropland flood exposure. So uh, agriculture is a big industry here in South Carolina, and we can see uh, how that's distributed across the state, looking at kind of small watersheds. Our, our crop exposure is largely in our uh, agricultural areas of the state, um, and it really depends on when the timing of that rainfall and, and the crop that's planted at the time. Additionally, we looked at uh, cultural resources. So here's an example of that, looking at uh, points on the National Register of Historic Places, um, so we can see how those those risks change over time, as well as our military installations. Um, this is uh, Marine Corps Air Station, Buford, and Paris Island um, Training Depot. So we can see you know, what their future risk looks like. Um, under future scenarios. Uh, the Department of Defense is very aware of their increasing risk and, and they're taking a lot of proactive measures to, to protect these installations and make sure they're viable for the long term. And then kind of finally on flooding, you know, we have to recognize that, uh, again, not everybody has the same ability to recover um, from flooding or be prepared for flooding. So, so we did intersect our flooding risk with our social vulnerability uh, to try to identify those areas of the state that we probably need to target um, more heavily for our resilience efforts. And, and that, again, tends to be our more rural areas, um, kind of between the uh, metropolitan areas. But uh, yeah, we have a, a lot of folks in there that just don't have resources to be able to deal with this impacts. And from our experience with, a, with this, with our disaster recovery side of the office, these are the same areas that have been hit repetitively uh, with, with flooding in the, in the past few years. In addition to flooding, we did do a brief uh, look at some other hazards, uh, looking at uh, wildfire burn probabilities, um, hurricanes, lightning strikes, tornadoes, that sort of thing. Um, so there's a section that briefly looks at that, but we'll be expanding on those analyses uh, in future versions of the report. Um, likewise, earthquakes are, are included in the in the planning uh, process. South Carolina, uh, you know, has a history of large earthquakes. Uh, most people don't realize that, but you know, the Charleston earthquake. In the 1800s was pretty devastating. Um, we've had a lot of growth in the state since then, uh, and we are listed pretty high risk for earthquakes in that uh, Charleston area. There's also a chapter that looks at kind of current processes, and I won't go through these, but you know, we thought it was important to try to evaluate how things are currently done in the state so we can make recommendations. Um, but we kind of broke them down into our, our definition of anticipate, absorb, recover, and thrive. Uh, and focus on some key things, building codes, looking at how our building codes uh, stack up. Our building codes are fairly good uh, with the exception of a few things. One, we adopted a weakened code for hurricanes um, kind of in the Midlands of the state. Uh, so we recommend adopting the full code and the seismic code in part of our coastal plain was weakened. Um, and given our history with earthquakes, we, we think it's important to adopt the full code. So that's one of the recommendations in the plan. Uh, also looking at how the recent Sackett decision uh, impacts our wetlands. Um, wetlands are super important for our flood protection, that natural system. Uh, so looking at kind of a, a real quick anal analysis of um, you know, the number of the, the acres of wetlands that are no longer have federal protections. Um, it's pretty substantial, especially in our coastal plain. Uh, so one of the recommendations of the plan is that, is that the state needs to evaluate whether we should uh, develop some statewide protections because currently there are no statewide uh, protections for isolated wetlands. Uh, there's a funding chapter, uh, try to identify funding streams um, and coordinating uh, funding for resilience efforts. Um, a lot of that's kind of South Carolina specific, but we do look a lot at how the federal funding um, runs through the state. 
And then that all kind of feeds into our recommendations chapter, uh, broken out into 10 really major themes, uh, improving data collection and coordination, uh, increasing education, outreach and disclosure. Uh, we've been working on our property disclosure form um, with our uh, labor licensing and regulation office. Um, working to coordinate watershed based resilience plannings and projects. Um, that's just getting kicked off now. We're hiring um, watershed coordinators to go into our, each of our major watersheds uh, and work with communities to, to coordinate their resilience efforts so we're not just moving water around and causing problems elsewhere, but really coming up with coordinated approaches for how to build resilience in the watersheds. Uh, working to incorporate those, those things into our planning, land use, and other regulatory processes. Uh, I mentioned the building codes already. Uh, trying to incorporate resilience into our infrastructure design. Um, you know, if we're designing a structure for 100 years, we need to make sure that it's um, able to withstand the, the conditions that will exist 100 years from now, um, that sort of thing. Uh, flood protection through conservation, I have one more slide on that. Um, incorporating resilience into our housing recovery. As I mentioned, we are the disaster recovery office as well. Um, so we've already adopted these recommendations uh, into our future recovery efforts. Um, working to establish a voluntary pre-disaster buyout program. Uh, so, so doing a, a pre-disaster buyout program as opposed to post-disaster buyout program. Um, buyout programs are, are certainly complicated and there's a lot to consider. So we, we really need to make sure we're working with communities as we try to develop that program. Uh, and then try to uh, maximize um, all the funding sources that we can bring for resilience activities. And last slide, um, really just wanted to highlight our, our conservation efforts. It's a priority for our agency. It's a priority for our governor um, as well. Uh, but we, we went through an exercise of trying to identify those priority conservation areas from a flood protection, flood protection lens. And so we've done that for each of our uh, watersheds statewide and the methodologies uh, there on the screen, but really looking at our flood hazard areas, marsh migration areas, uh, current wetlands, um, those areas of best infiltration. So those high quality soils and, and uh, good land use uh, types um, to try to identify those areas that give us the most bang for the buck when we're looking at conservation. Because um, that is that is a big priority, and we received uh, about two hundred million dollars in the last budget to really focus on this. So we'll be uh, trying to get some of these areas uh, conserved. And with that, hopefully, I stayed within my fifteen minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex. Yes, um, great job. Covered a lot of information in a short period of time. All right, next up, um, our next super speaker will provide us with an update on resilience efforts in the U.S. Virgin Islands, Dr. Kim Waddell. Now make you a presenter, and you should be able to share your screen. Shared the wrong one. <laughs> oh, wow. It's like a tunnel. <laughs> I know. I know. Sorry. Didn't mean to do that. Let's go That's back. okay. Uh, uh, go back. Let's see. Goodness, it's even worse now. Uh, Stop sharing, maybe, and then. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Go. Is it PowerPoint? Maybe under the window tab? It should be window. All right. Oh, I see it. And then you'll just need to, it's that left one, isn't it? Yeah, that one. And then you just need to slideshow. Perfect. There we go. All right. There we go. Perfect. Thanks. All right. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to thank Heather and her team at SCDRP for the invitation to share highlights of our soon to be released um, Hazard Mitigation Resilience Plan for the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, this is reflecting a collaboration uh, between the University of Virgin Islands, where I'm based, 
uh, and the Virgin Islands Territorial uh, Emergency Management Agency. So um, the planning process has been underway for about three years. Uh, we have an, a variety of partners, as you can see listed, or you know, with their logos on the left and on the right is sort of the process that includes stakeholder engagement, um, analysis and uh, assessments, hazard mitigation, hazard and environmental profiles, risk assessment, et cetera. And then all that is integrated uh, with engagement with our stakeholders into a, a variety of outcomes, first with a framework and then uh, a series of recommendations and a mitigation plan. And this has uh, really been uh, an incredible effort and resilience really has been guiding our activities, our research, and it's really the lens that we use uh, for the, the remaining planning effort. So the integration of resilience, you know, it's rise of a variety of things and basically mitigation plan, which is what hazard mitigation plans are traditionally requ required by FEMA. And uh, many of you know this, and they have three sort of standard tests, uh, uh, tasks. And on the left, you can see those. Um, one is to understand the hazards and risks. Second is to develop strategies to reduce those risks. And then finally, to mitigate or manage them. Whereas resilience planning really adds addressing the underlying conditions of the systems that are foundational to the communities, uh, the natural resources, and the built environment, with ultimately uh, designed to devise steps to build resilience. So this is, a, you actually saw a variation of this with Alex's uh, presentation just uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, resilience planning really seeks to, you know, reduce disaster or risk impact expenditures and shorten that recovery time. And so uh, for us here in the Caribbean, after the 2017 hurricanes, we you know, we took a major hit, uh, billions and billions of dollars worth of damage. And so if you look at state one, the green ball on the left, that really captures where we were before, prior to that, uh, th those uh, storms in 2017. Uh, obviously resources uh, and infrastructure failed after the event. Uh, you see a loss of services and, and function. And then the response and recovery efforts follow the time and, and the time and cost really depends on how resilient that system was prior to the disaster. And so more resilient systems recover quickly, cost less. Less resilient systems uh, often take more time and sometimes don't even recover to that previous state. And we see a mix of this here in the Virgin Islands because of things like the pandemic really slowed our recovery process. We are still recovering from the 2017 hurricanes. We are still in uh, uh, rebuilding uh, a lot of our infrastructure and the pandemic really dragged that out. So um, this is another busy slide, but I, across the top of the common hazards, we assess, uh, you know, uh, across two major categories of resources. So on the left, we have our critical infrastructure, um, you know, governance capabilities, energy, transportation, communications, etc. The hazards are there at the top. We have earthquakes, tsunamis, landslides, uh, obviously hurricanes, we have uh, droughts, and then obviously there's sea level rise and other uh, climate change related um, uh, stressors. And on the right are the essential services that mu also must be assessed given their importance to communities and the stakeholders that work in and support that crew. Kim, I, Kim, I think you're muted. We lost you for a second. Kim, you came back muted. There you go. Kim, can you hear me?
Kim, can you unmute yourself? Are you able to unmute yourself? Your internet blinked and then you came back with the mute button on. Are you able to mute? unmute Here yourself? we go. Finally. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, good. I didn't even That's see okay. that happen, so. Right. <laughs> That's okay. Can you see my slide? I see the plan goals slide. Okay, I just lost. Um, That's okay. You might you might go back one slide if you need to catch up where you uh, were. So you see the plan goals now. I see plan goals. That's right. Okay, good, good. All right. So I, I mentioned the managed risk. Now I, I was just speaking to thinking systems, and this is where um, coherent strategies for resilience uh, building. So the next few slides are going to be snapped. I think we both are having technical difficulties today. Kim, we lost you for a second. All right, can you unmute me? I can hear you. Okay. There you are. Now I can see All you right. too. All right, great. So like I said, the next few slides really are snapshots of what we covered, uh, many of the same topics that uh, Alex covered for South Carolina, we've done as well for the Virgin Islands, but I'm focusing on just housing. Um, uh, and beginning with some of the hazards, uh, for example, hurricane winds. And so, as you know, hurricanes are an annual threat, uh, especially here in the Caribbean, but throughout the Southeast and then uh, here in the USVI, due to its topography, we're quite vulnerable to strong winds. And so homes and communities that are at higher elevations will experience even stronger wind speeds than at sea level. And so, for example, Half of more than half the homes in St. Thomas and St. John to the north there on the map uh, would experience Cat 5 strength winds, while at sea level that might be at a Cat 4. And so we're talking about elevations that go up to about 1,800 feet on, uh, on our islands. Uh, obviously, flooding, uh, both uh, coastal and rain induced, is another hazard. Um, and again, you have a maps here where the houses, uh, all the housing is in red, and then the blue highlights the uh, flood areas from coastal and rain-induced flooding. Um, this is uh, more than 20% of our homes are in the flood zone, and most of those, over 30%, are in St. Croix, which you can see the larger island to the south, or at the bottom of the, the map there. <clears throat> So climate change is triggering some emerging threats. Uh, for example, I mean, we've had drought all along, but it seems to be exacerbated. Currently, we're in a year, three-year drought as we speak. And then this past summer, like most of the plant, we're seeing extreme temperatures. And so uh, it'll put more pressure on households, um, our water security, food security, as well as just maintaining comfortable temperatures, whether it's in schools or in our homes. Uh, but given that Power electricity is something like 46, per, 46 cents per kilowatt. Uh, it's extremely high. And so running an air conditioning can mean hundreds of dollars added to your electric bill, which really stresses out our modest and low income families. Um, so human activity like development can also exacerbate uh, some of those flooding challenges. And so this is due to the impervious surfaces uh, like roads that can channel water as it runs downhill from you know, rain events. And so, again, you can see the, the red areas, the dark red areas are all um, developed areas. And we've seen since 1985 a, a significant increase in stormwater runoff. All this development also puts more infrastructure at risk to earthquakes. Uh, and then, unfortunately, we, are, we don't have uh, a, a comprehensive land and water use plan for the territory. One's being developed, but the fact is we don't have one that's being used now. 
And so uh, development has been somewhat uncontrolled over uh, the past 30 plus years. Um, I think the other challenge, and this gets to the water security, is that uh, development and those impervious surfaces can also reduce groundwater recharging of our, our, our major aquifers. And the most, um, the one on St. Croix, the, south, the, the lower part of the map there, you can see that nearly 60% of our aquifers um, are, 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 are developed, and that's captured in the gray there. Uh, we also did some modeling and forecasting of development in the future. And so we developed three scenarios. You know, one is business as usual, which is sort of you know no restraints on development, uh, feasible middle of the road where some guidance, like the new uh, comprehensive land and water use plan, if it's enacted and has some teeth to it, uh, I think can generate perhaps a more feasible level of development. And then if you know we were totally smart growth and really started to focus on uh, concentrating the development in certain areas and protecting our uh, natural environment, you know, our forests and scrub and agricultural lands, we might see a pattern uh, of smart growth. And so those three maps there sort of capture what we're projecting for the territory over those three, uh, three examples. Um, you know, we also estimated potential losses for the three islands based on the, these three levels of, uh, of development. And so what's clear is that uh, development policies, you know, if we're thoughtful about it, will be far less expensive than doing nothing or attempting to address issues through reactive or standalone investments. And so you can see the estimated cost, uh, present, current trend, feasible and smart growth. You can see the bars and for all three islands, uh, St. Croix, our largest island, uh, has the most at risk uh, because it's actually one of the least developed islands. St. Thomas is sort of in the middle of the pack. We're highly developed already, uh, and so the, the changes may not be that noticeable. And St. John, being more than 60% national park, uh, has very modest uh, uh, development uh, now and in, in, as well as into the future. So uh, like Alex's and South Carolina's, we've come up with a series of, of recommendations. Um, this is just one example for housing. You know, when we think about systems, we want to develop a comp comprehensive public housing plan based on a needs assessment with partnership with the you know, communities uh, in our various towns. Um, like other plans, again, South Carolina, you know, education is going to be important to raise awareness and encourage landlords and landowners as well as developers to participate in the housing choice voucher program, which is something we're recommending uh, and it's also put forward by the government. Um, and then I think uh, we have actually a, a large historic um, areas in most of our towns uh, built by the Danes, you know, two, three, four hundred years ago. And a lot of that is undeveloped. I mean, it's, uh, you know, there are abandoned buildings. They need a fair bit of work. But the fact is they're ideally located, um, central to transportation and amenities. And yet if we could uh, rebuild those areas and restore the, the historic districts, as well as new development that's in high density, so we can minimize the footprint, uh, the development footprint relative to our natural resources, uh, as well as our aquifers, this would be a huge step forward. We also think about governance. Uh, you know, we have to partner with nonprofits here in the territory, as well as relief agencies, to acquire, renovate, and build affordable housing. This is one of the biggest challenges we face in the territory: it is affordable housing. It affects our students here at the university, uh, as well as you know, modest and low-income families. It's really expensive to live here. Uh, and so again, just sort of recapping, uh, uh, this is our three main uh, insights. Again, all HM HMPs, hazard mitigation plans, you know, they, they have to manage risk, but thinking with resilience, we, we really need to show the interdependency of the systems, you know, from transportation to food provisioning, to agriculture, to telecommunications. These systems are all connected, whether it's by roads, or um, you know uh, telecommunications, and then practicing governance. You know the idea that a system approach and good governance really are going to be essential for us to 
create a resilient Virgin Islands uh, that employs adaptive management of our risks, uh, especially in, in the face of climate change. So it was a high level, fast overview, just using the uh, uh, housing sector as one example, but uh, I wanna thank you for your time and be happy to take questions um, uh, from time permitting from. Fantastic, thank you so much, Kim. Yes, I think we have, we're gonna do uh, questions to both Alex and Kim at the same time. Let's go ahead and uh, get our first question. Either raise your hand to get in the speaking queue or type your question into the chat box. Any questions? Oh, all right. <laughs> that's I guess see, we were you, thorough. You covered it all. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's right. Um, also, folks always think of questions later. So, um, Alex and Kim, if you would, please add your email addresses to the chat box, and sure. um, our attendees can contact you later if they think of uh, follow-up questions for you. Uh, thank you so much, Alex and Kim, for taking the time to share what I call momentous updates from South Carolina and the U.S. Virgin Islands. You both have worked very hard, many people, many years to produce these plans. So congratulations and hats off to both of you. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. I have a few more slides. and I'm going to share my screen one more time. Okay, so the annual SCDRP Advisory Board election opens next Friday. We have four open seats and have received the following nominations. Each nominee that you see has been verified by the SCDRP Governance Committee that they uh, meet the qualifications for the seat for which they were nominated. The Advisory Board will vote to approve this ballot on November 2nd. And then, very next day, November 3rd, we will launch online full partnership voting for a two-week election period. So a big thank you to all of you that have stepped forward for leadership roles with SCDRP. You will be hearing more about the election very soon. To reach new partners and share timely and relevant information, we utilize our social media outlets, and here they are. So get out your phones, scan this QR code, or click the link on your computer. Both will take you to a link tree of ways to reach us and connect with us that include the SCDRP website, including our How to Become a Member webpage, our YouTube recordings, LinkedIn, Twitter, now X, and Facebook. Our most popular social media outlet is LinkedIn. So if you haven't found us on LinkedIn yet, please do. Also, please let me know if you have new ideas or news to post. Please note, our next monthly partnership meeting is bumped up one week due to the Thanksgiving holiday. We will meet on Thursday, November 16th from 10 to 11 a.m. Our super speaker will be Raquel Fernandez of Sierra Club, Florida, and the Hispanic Environmental Observatory. She's been doing some really neat work. Raquel's been organizing forums with Spanish-speaking communities entitled Effective Hurricane Preparedness Responding to Climate Change, and Raquel will share with us their unique, culturally appropriate strategies, experiences, and lessons learned. So I'm looking forward to seeing all of you there. So we have some time for partner sharing. Please use these final seven or so minutes to share what's going on with your region. You can raise your hand, you can post in the chat box, um, and let us know what's going on with you. Any announcements? All right, if you would prefer, you can go ahead and type your announcements um, in the chat box, or you can send them to scdrp at socora.org at any time. Um, each week we gather your resources and updates and we download them from the chat box and we share your resources in our next bulletin. 
I see a uh, announcement coming through from Randall. Thank you for that. Emily, announcement from Socorro, Carrie, Sea Grant, Amanda, South Carolina Sea Grant. Take a few minutes to read the chat. These I will add all of these to our next SCDRP bulletin as well. Keep them coming. Great. This formally concludes our October monthly partnership meeting. A very special thank you to our super speakers, Alex Butler and Dr. Kim Waddell. A special thank you to you, particularly in light of our technological difficulties. We all don't have the same access to internet, so I appreciate you sticking with us. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing all of you again on November 16th. Have a terrific day. Thank you.